page 321 what a mighty god what a mighty god we serve what a mighty god we serve angels bow before him heaven and earth adore him what a mighty god we serve one more time what a mighty god we serve what a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. Let's do it one more time. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. Amen. What a mighty God we serve. Amen. And we started off with a good morning. Okay. You want to let him All right. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this day that you've given us, that you woke us up, Lord. It's because of you that we, we are here, Lord, and that we did wake up this morning. And we just give you all the glory, Lord. We just pray that... Uh, that the people that couldn't make it tonight, Lord, that uh, they can listen in online. Or, Lord, we just pray that uh, for those people that are in the hospitals, Lord, that just can't get out and get to, get to church, Lord. Uh, anybody who's sick or going through anything, Lord, we just, we just pray over that, Lord. We just thank you for this morning, for the men's prayer group. Uh, just for the men being faithful to just be here and, and uh, just the fellowship and, and, you know, just to help to edify and lift up one another, Lord. And, Lord, we just thank you uh, for the women that come and pray and clean the church on Saturdays, Lord, that help us when we go knocking on doors, Lord, because we need to tell everybody about what you've done for us, Lord, in the world that we're living in today, Lord. We just thank you and we glorify you, Lord. And I just pray for the pastor, for the Holy Unction tonight, Lord, for the word. That we keep it in our hearts and use it during the week, Lord, and apply it to our life. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. All right, Philippians chapter number three tonight, and uh, you're already there. Good job, buddy. So Philippians chapter number three tonight, we're going to look at uh, examples of Christian believers. This chapter here is a great uh, example or a great chapter when it comes to the example of believers. Now, we looked at last week, last two weeks was Paul, Paul's testimony. And as we've seen, Paul was a Hebrew of Hebrews, right? And uh, he said, I followed the, the, the law to the letter. I was blameless. And, uh, and he, but he said he had zeal but no knowledge, right? And so we're going to look at tonight here, uh, pressing on, uh, marks, uh, marking those who are examples. And so as we grow in our Christian walk, in our Christian life, we ought, to, we ought to find someone who is a good example that we can follow after, amen, that we can mark, amen. And uh, so we're going to look at some of the marks of uh, those who, uh, who are examples. So uh, Philippians chapter number 3, and I'm going to start out in verse number 17. We're going to read through the end of the chapter here. Uh, chapter, uh, verse number 17 says, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk, so as ye have, uh, have us for an example. So it's good to, to have someone there f uh, as an example. Praise the Lord. And uh, for it says, verse 18, For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, whose mind earthly things. Uh, for our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look uh, the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change your vile body that it may be fashioned like unto His glorious body, according to the working whereby He is able even to subdue all things unto Himself. Amen. And uh, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Ask the Lord to bless the reading of His Word tonight. Gracious Heavenly Father, we love You and we thank You again for the reading of Your Word tonight. We're thankful that it's an errant, infallible Lord, that it is our final authority. Lord, we're thankful that... Um, Faith does come by hearing, and hearing is by the Word of God. 
And we're thankful that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And Lord, we beheld His glory as the glory of the only begotten of, uh, of, of the Father, full of grace and truth. So we're thankful that tonight. And Lord, help us not to forsake the Word of God, but help us to learn from it, help us to glean upon it, Lord. Help us to follow it tonight, Lord. And we just pray tonight as we give this lesson that you do give me the unction of the Holy One tonight, that uh, I'll be able to explain this, that this will go forth, that all may understand, that we can be edified from it tonight, that we will uh, walk away from here knowing we met with God, Lord, that it will help us to better serve you as we, um, as we continue to put on the whole armor of God, as we armor up in this old world that we're having to battle here today, Lord. Bless us here tonight in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. All right, so as we look at tonight here, this passage has to do with the example we set before the world and also before other Christians. Many of us heard and many of us remember that uh, the, the, the saying is this, it takes a lifetime to build a, a testimony, doesn't it? And it truly does. You, you take some folks that are, that are, have been on earth here for a, a, a long time, right? And it does, it takes a lifetime to build that testimony. But it only takes a moment to completely destroy that testimony. And it's so true as, as we walk in this Christian life that, you know, we are to set an example not only before the world, before other unbelievers, but also we're to set the example before other believers. Um, far too many times do I hear, and I've heard twice here today already, today. Well, preacher, I'm going to tell you, if it wasn't for other Christians, I'd be in church. But that's the reason why I'm not in church. And I've heard that twice today. And, 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 and so true it is that not only are we to set that example before the world, but also before other believers. And how is that? First of all, that's the way we live. You know, it, it, it's so true, the way we live and what we do, that's what influences people. It's how we live. Now, if you live like the devil and live like the world and say you're a Christian, even the world knows that's not right. I mean, even the world will, will know. And it's amazing to me, preacher, that here, here we have unbelievers that know more about the Bible than believers because they'll point out what you're doing wrong. Well, I thought you were a Christian. Christians don't do this. It doesn't the Bible say dot, dot, dot? And you go, whoa. And so as we, as the way we live and the way... Uh, and, and what we do, it influences people. So the point is this. The life we live sets a pattern for others to follow. Also, we must mark and follow after those who live as an example of Jesus Christ. So let's look at that tonight here. I'm going to go ahead and jump right into point number one. As we see in this first verse here, verse number 17, there are some who walk as examples of Christ. There are some who walk as examples of Christ. We see brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. So who is that? Well, first of all, we see Paul, right? According to the scripture, Paul was an example. As he said, be followers together of me. Here's what he said to the church of Corinth here, the first letter to the church of Corinth in chapter number 4, verse 17 through verse number, verse 14 through verse number 17. He said, I write not these things to you to shame you, he says. But as my beloved sons, I warn you. You know, a lot of times we get too caught up in thinking the preacher's, uh, uh, you know, preaching the way he preaches to shame people. No, he's warning you. Amen? 
And Paul is saying the same thing. He said, again, I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. For though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fa fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Wherefore, he says, I beseech you, be ye followers of me. For this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son, and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ, as I teach every, everywhere in every church. And then he says in chapter 11, verse 1 the 1 Corinthians, be a followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. So here Paul's the first example as we're looking at here. There are some, listen church, there are some who walk as examples of Christ. Paul, one of them. And then and, and later in, the, in this book of, 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 to the church of Philippi in chapter number 4, he, in verse number 8 and 9, he says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, Boy, don't we have a hard time finding that today. You know, as I tell the church, and in church you know this, I haven't watched a news broadcast in almost three years. And what's, what's the, why, why have I not watched the news in almost three years? Because it's lying to you. I got tired of being lied to. I didn't know which way was which. I started doing it about, about uh, you know, part way into the whole COVID situation. Every time I turned around, there was something new about COVID. I mean, COVID was like this monster, uh, you know, lurking around the corner, ready to jump on you. It was amazing to me that it was just this horrible, uh, 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 deadly virus going around that you had to be tested just to know you had it. But it was horrible. It was bad. So bad. Here's when I said, I'm done. I'm done with this. I've had enough. This was about spring break time. They said that there's COVID-19 in the ocean. And that every time a wave hits the shore, it's like a sneeze. And all of those beachgoers and all of those uh, spring breakers are going to be super spreaders when they go back to their hometowns. I said, I'm done. And Paul says, he said, whatsoever things are true. Where do we find the truth today? It's the Word of God. And that was the one place, listen, the church was the one place we neglected first. We neglected the, the house of God. We neglected, and by neglecting the house of God, you neglected and, and, and you didn't encourage the preaching of the Word of God. I know a church in Chesapeake. They put plastic over the Bible, just like here. They put plastic over the Bible. I mean, come on, folks. Paul says, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. And we're doing completely opposite today. I'm talking about the church is doing opposite today. We're not thinking on the things of virtue. And our churches, folks, and I'm talking about born-again believers, we don't think of, the, of those things. Paul says, Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, the very next word, there's a comma and there's a two-letter word next. He says, do. Boy, it's that simple, isn't it? 
There's another two-letter word that the Lord tells us to do, isn't it? Is go. He said again, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things, those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, he said, do. And the God of peace shall be with you. 2 Timothy 1 verse 13 says, Hold fast the form of sound words, which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is, Christ, which is in Christ Jesus. See, Paul was an example. Again, as we, as we look at here, pressing on, marking those who are examples, we see those examples who follow Christ. Number letter B is others walked as examples as well. Because as we look at, at, at the second part of that verse, verse 17 again, Brethren, be ye followers together me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. Others walked as an example as well. You know, God still has His remnant. Amen. I was praying for the remnant today. I was, I was praising God. I was praying and, and, and I was praying for that judge today. Amen. And, and, and I said, Lord, you still have your remnant. And the man, I, and I knew he was a believer because he was telling me Bible scripture. He, he, he first of all looked at me. He goes, you got a criminal record? I said, no, sir. You've been convicted of a crime? No, sir. He said, what do you do for a living? I said, I pastor a local church. Well, he says... And then he starts quoting scripture. <laughs> Did I give him 20? No, I didn't. Hey, here's the joke, Pastor. So just before Christmas time, I was giving money away at Walmart. I said, I'll give you $50 if you can quote me one Bible verse. Believe it or not, I couldn't give that money away. I end, up, I end up doing it. I mean, there were some that knew. I mean, they give me a part of the verse, and I said, well, Merry Christmas, you know. And, but praise the Lord. And I was, and I was praying this, this morning, and I was thanking God for the remnant. You see, God still has His remnant. God still has His people. And there are those that we can find as good examples. 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 6, it says, And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. And then chapter number 2 verse 10 of 1 Thessalonians says, Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holy and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. The Bible said they behaved themselves. Boy, that's an oxymoron today, isn't it? Amen. And then 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 17, For yourselves know how you ought to follow us. For we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. Mm. Knowing how to behave yourself, amen? By the way, there's order in the church. There's got to be order in the church. Let all things be done decently in order, the scripture says. And there has to be order. There has to be a way we behave ourselves. Paul says we ought to know how to behave ourselves in the house of God. Amen? And I find it very disrespectful how... How now today we don't think we should at least behave ourselves in the house of God. How we disrespect the house of God. How we disrespect the man of God. How we disrespect, disrespect the word of God. Amen? Amen. All right, let's look at the second thing here tonight. Say there are many who walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Let's look back here at verse 18. 
Because if it, this goes right along with verse 17, by the way, because you see the little, what do you call those brackets or sad face, smiley faces? They used to be a little smiley face. You put a little semicolon in a, or a colon and a smiley face. But anyways, this goes along with verse 17. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Again, that's why Paul's saying we need to mark those as good examples. We need to follow those as good examples because there are those, Paul is saying, there are those, uh, and, and here's what I believe, walking amongst you. Believe it or not, there are enemies of the cross of Christ here in the churches. And our churches today, and I'm talking about our, our, our Bible-believing, Bible-preaching, hellfire brimstone Tell it like it is, churches. There are the enemies of the cross of Christ. There was in those days, there are today. There's nothing new under the sun. Amen? Ecclesiastes 1 verse 9. And that's what Paul was saying here in verse 18. For many walk. What's he saying? Oh, there are many who are going, seems to be the right direction. Listen, by the way, there are some in the churches today, they know how to walk, they know how to talk, they know how to say the right words, they'll wear the right things when it comes to the house of God. They'll perform all the right actions. But they're the enemies of the cross. Amen. For many walk, it says, of whom I have told you often, and now I'll tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. I wonder this preacher, do you think he was weeping of those that were of the world who are the enemies of the cross? I believe he was weeping of the believers. I believe he was weeping of the believers, those that are enemies of the cross. And here's what he said. He said in, in verse number 19, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly. And whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Do you, you realize that verse 18 and 19 are one sentence? One sentence, one thought. Let's look at those here tonight. Their end is destruction. Their end is destruction. For again, for many walk, of whom I told you often and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction. What is the, what is the destruction? Well, first of all, we find everlasting punishment. What, what is the end destruction? Everlasting punishment. It's a place called hell. And the Bible says, And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. There's two deaths, folks. I preached a funeral about a week ago, and I preached that in Luke chapter 16, that, that there, 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 are, there is life, and there is eternity after death. There is eternity that one either goes to heaven to be with the Lord for eternity, or one goes to hell, and, and, and there is everlasting destruction. And everlasting punishment. You know, the world mocks hell, don't, doesn't it? And it has from the very beginning. The world mocks hell. Hollywood mocks hell. You know, it's amazing to me, all these Hollywood stars coming out trying to tell us what to do and everything. You know, they get on commercials. You ever watch that on commercials? And I want you to look at it in a little fine, little fine print. Uh, somewhere on the screen it says, paid actors. Try this new drug. It did me wonder. Woo-hoo, paid actor. And, and, it, and, and when, it, when I see things like that and I see commercials like that and I see these actors, you know, a lot of them are now coming out that were actors back in the 70s. Dino Might, amen? You remember that one? J.J. Walker. 
I mean, and then, and then uh, uh, selling uh, the insurance and then this uh, 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 car shield and things like that. And you see all of these actors and actresses uh, from, from years ago and they're trying to tell you to buy this as if they are buying it themselves. They're actors. They get paid to be someone they're not. They get paid to act like, they literally get paid to lie. And they call it acting. Uh, when I was a kid, one of my uh, favorite movies was um, uh, Peach Dragon. Anybody remember that one? And uh, so, so here, here he was in this new town called Passamaquoddy. And... Uh, there was a doctor who rolled into town. He had to throw an anchor out just to stop uh, his, his horseless carriage. And everything opened up and he was a roadside salesman selling snake oil. And he had his little assistant who would dress up like different people and try to convince the people, hey, look what, he come up there with, with crutches and then he drank this, uh, this potion or this, or this medicine or this miracle working drug that's going to cure everything. And, and he gets up there and he begins to shake off one crutch and he shakes off another crutch and he begins to dance and people go, ooh, I got to have it. Well, today they're on TV. Trying to sell things to you. And here we have these paid actors. And, and they go on and, and we think we idolize them. And we think they're wonderful and we think they're great. And, and, and then even to the point that we, when we hear one of them die, we think, oh no, don't tell me that's true. But those same people will mock hell. They ridicule hell. They'll make it sound like it's a great place to go to. Where the devil has domain and the devil is ruling hell. I'm telling you right now, the devil ain't in hell right now. He will be one day. You know where the devil is today? Huh? The devil's in the churches. That's where he's at. Amen. You're all right. You're all right, brother. That's where he's at today. And so everlasting destruction, their end, listen, their end is everlasting punishment. Number two, their end is also indignation, wrath, tribulation, and anguish. That's too much. I can read lips, sister. <laughs> Amen. Let me, let me slow down. Indignation. In, in, dig. Nation. Okay, all right, all right. Am I too slow now? And wrath, comma. <laughs> I'm teasing you. Tribulation and anguish, all right. <laughs> Amen. Romans 2, verse 8 and 9, it says, But unto them that are uh, contentious, and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first and also the Gentile. Number three is the vengeance of God. 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 7 through 9 And, and to you who are troubled rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. That's the same Jesus, right? The world and modern churches say, Oh, He loves everybody. No matter what sin you're in, no matter what direction you're going, He'll go with you. Hmm. The Bible says that in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God. We find number four, the judgment of God. Second Peter 2 verse 9 
the Lord knoweth how to, do, how to deliver the godly out of temptations. Thank God for that. Amen. And to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. Number five, the lake of fire. This is all within the, their ends is destruction. The lake of fire, Romans 20 verse 15, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. Romans 21 verse number eight, we had to memorize this on the Romans road tracks where the Bible said, but the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and the whoremongers and the sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. You've heard that saying, he that is only born one time will die twice. If we live our life, Robin, and never be born again, and we only have a physical birth, which as far as I can see, everyone in here in this room has had a physical birth, right? Right? There you go. Thank you. That's, that's, what, that's what amazes me about all of these folks that are protesting for abortion. and well, They ought to thank their mama because she chose life. Amen? <laughs> their mama was pro-life. Think about that. See, if you're only born one time, you'll die twice. What is that? What is that? First you'll have that physical death, then you'll have a spiritual death. The Bible calls that... The second death, the lake of fire. That's why we need to be born again, folks, so that we die one time. Letter B. Their God is their belly. You see, the belly here refers, this word belly refers to the appetite for sensuality and desire. And it's the desire for physical pleasures of this world. That's what the Bible means there. It says their God is their belly. Their God has become their, their, their physical desires for the things of this world. Isn't that so true today? People are worshiping these, and I, and I see it on, on, on the television. I, I, I like watching car shows. I like them rebuilding the cars and things like that and racing the cars. And, and I hear it over and over and over again. When something goes good, they say the car gods are looking upon us. Their God is their belly. And then there's this, this, these swamp people, huh? How many see that, them crocodile swamp people? Saying the same thing. Well, the gods of the swamp are looking down on us today. It's their belly. These pickers. I've heard them say the same thing. Well, the picking gods are good to us today. God help us. That, that, that literally, that is their God has become their belly, their desires, their, their, their desire and their sensuality for physical pleasures. Then we can get into the sexual pleasures. The desires of the flesh have become the gods of the people. They, they, their, their belly, their desire... It's become their God. What, what am I saying? That's what they worship. That's what they go after. That's what they're chasing. It's become their God. That's what controls them. Right? How about habits? Huh? We, we, we always, when we look at habits, we always think, of, oh, drug habits, alcohol. But how about the habit of staying home from church? It's become your God. You know, what, 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 some of you, see if you can re, uh, answer this. What's the pastor say why people don't go to Sunday school? Because they're lovers of the covers. Amen. It's become their God. But you're right, Robert. Uh, 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 Sunday, Sunday morning decision is made on Saturday night. 
If you set yourself to say on Saturday night, I'm going to get up to go to church on Sunday morning, you'll get up and go to church. But if you wait till Sunday morning to make that decision, you ain't going to make that decision. You'll make the opposite decision. Because that bed will get warm. All of a sudden, it gets warm. All of a sudden, that old hard mattress gets real comfortable, don't it? But if you make that decision on Saturday night, you'll get up on Sunday morning to go to church. You see, it's become our God is our belly. Romans chapter 8, verse 5 through 6, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is what? Is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Romans 16, verse 18, For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. See, when it comes to serving the sensuality of things and the desires... Listen to me, you're going to find those good words. By the way, here's the thing about the Internet. The Internet will give you the answer that you want. I had Robert here as an example on the Sunday school class. I said, make up a number and, and Google such and such number COVID cases. And did not a report in the newspaper come up with that exact number of cases in such and such place? It'll give you the answer you want. I said four, five, six, seven, wasn't it? Yeah. And it said there was uh, 4,567 cases of COVID somewhere. Yeah, was, uh, 333. 333, and it was 333, and there was another number. It was a certain amount of percentage. You know, the, the, the Internet will give you an answer. It'll give you the answer that you want. You see, it'll, it'll, it'll give you these fair speeches, right? And that's what Paul was saying. It deceives the hearts of the simple. And I believe that's the way it is with the news media. I think the news media is just there to deceive. By the way, it's called the media. That ought to tell you something, amen? Look that word up. Ephesians 4, verse 17 through 19, the Bible says, But this I say therefore and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feelings have given themselves over unto lasciviousness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. You see, their destruction is in. And here, all of this is, there are many who walk as the enemies of the Christ. Here's how, here's how you mark those. Here's how you can spot those. You see, their God is their belly. Their God is their, their desires and their sensualities. Number C, or letter C, number three, is their glory is their shame. Again, in verse number 19, it says, the God, is, God is their belly, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is their shame. The things they glory in is what they ought to be ashamed of. We have no shame today. There are no shame in the people today. Amen? It don't take you long to go to Walmart. You'll realize there ain't no shame in people. 
you know what I call Walmart redneck mall. <laughs> I mean, you'll see. It. How many remember that website called WalmartPeople.com? I'm telling you, some of the craziest things you see in Walmart. And now they've got them not, not only shooting the brother, but they got them fighting and carrying on and trashing the place. And there's no shame. Getting on the internet, getting on TikTok and acting stupid. There's no shame, folks. And that's what the Bible says here. Those that are the enemies of the cross of Christ, their glory is their shame. The things that they glory in is what they ought to be ashamed of. And now it's in our churches. You know, the, the, the things that I see people do today inside the house of God, no respect. None. None respect for the house of God. Some things we ought to be ashamed of. Amen. Psalm chapter number 10, verse 3, it says, For the wicked boasteth of his heart's desire and blesseth the covetous. Here's what the Scripture says. Whom the Lord abhorreth. Well, that's a word we don't hear anymore today. You know, when I was reading over the case of the... Of, of, our two grandsons, Mama. I've got her case file and everything. And by the way, the judge had it yesterday too, or Monday. And here was the word of the judge, the word of the judge, and the last case they did. He was abhorred. That's what this case says. Those were his words of what she's done to her previous children. That comes from the word. That comes from the words of a judge. Miss Linda, a judge has seen a lot of stuff, it? especially when it comes to family court. And this judge said he was abhorred of what he was reading that she had done. And the Bible says here again, the Lord. Those things abhorred the Lord. But I'm t what am I talking about? The wicked boast of, of his heart's desire. And he blessed. The Bible says he blessed, not God. The, I'm talking about the wicked bless the covetous. Be careful about what we laugh about. Amen? <laughs> Be careful what we're entertained with. Luke 12 verse 15. And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Two weeks ago I did two funerals in one week. My first two years when I took this church, I did 14 funerals. I mean, it's about one every two months. And here's what I realized. All those things that we fuss about, the things, the things, whose will they be after you pass away? Miss Marie was the last to pass away. I love Miss Marie. Uh, Marie Stovall, what a blessing. <laughs> she just, I'm telling you, she was a woman. She told it like it was. I go over to see her. I said, Marie, you going to open the curtains? I don't want to see what's going on outside. It's me and Jesus in here right now. I don't want to look out what's going on out there. And she looked at me, why would I want to look out there, preacher? <laughs> I said, I love you. <laughs> she was Marie Stovall. She she went to Old Tabernacle Church. How many remember that right up here on 58? Yeah, Amen. She was saved at that church as a little girl. Faithfully served God until she couldn't. She was a lady that some of you remember. She'd come through here hurting. I mean hurting. And you would hear her moaning. And then you walk up. You okay? Does it sound like I'm okay? Right? 
And somebody said one time, well, Marie, if you're hurting that bad, stay home. She said, I'm going to hurt that bad, this bad at home, so I might as well be in a good place. And she said to me, she said, look, my family ain't got nothing to fight over because I ain't got nothing to fight over. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> That's right. And so again here, as the Lord said, take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the things which he possesseth. It's not about the cars that we have. And I love cars. Listen, I love cars. Miss Candy said one time, she said, if it was up to you, you'd have a bunch of them, right? I said, yeah, you're right. But it doesn't consist. It's not the amount of cars that we have. It's not the size of house that we have. It's not the portfolio that we have. It's not the abundance of the things that we have. Colossians 3, verse 5, Mortify therefore the member, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection. Inordinate affection. Here the, here the thing is today is, oh, well, homosexuality is not mentioned in the Bible. Inordinate affection. You know what that means? The things that are against nature. Inordinate affections. You see, their glory is their shame. Letter D. I think I'll wrap it up with here because then I'll be done. I'll have to go back to look at point number three tomorrow. But they mind earthly things. End of verse number 19 says again, who mind earthly things. And that always, goes, that always has me go back and remember... Uh, Romans 12, verse 2, right? We know verse number 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Right? But what's verse number 2 tell us? Mm. And be not conformed to this world. That's what the Bible says. We're believers. We're not to be conformed to this world. Listen, folks, you can't act like the devil and serve God at the same time. You cannot act like the devil and try to serve God at the same time. Because he said you can serve two masters. By the way, the last thing I, last I knew that anything with two heads is a monster. You can't serve two masters, the Scripture says. The Lord says... He said, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good. Why are we to be transformed? Why are we to live a separate life? Why are we to have the renewing of our mind that we can prove the goodness of God? that we can prove that is good and acceptable in the perfect will of God. And then Paul says, 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5, casting down imaginations. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. Exalting yourself against the Word of God. We see that today, don't we? Poor. I did a lesson today. And the Scripture goes on to say, and bringing into captivity every thought in the, and to the obedience of Christ. But I did a lesson today, and I'll close with this. We'll look at the rest of this next week. But I did a lesson today in our men's prayer meeting and uh, I read out of Jeremiah chapter 12. And I would challenge you this week, if you could write it down and remember this, read Jeremiah chapter 12. Read it slow. It's not one of those that we could read like a novel, okay? By the way, when you read the Bible, read it slow. 
okay? I know a lot of good preachers that are up in age, they're writing down the Bible. Some read the Bible out loud because they know the faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. But I would encourage you to read it really slow because there are some things that, uh, that God says that is hard for us to digest because... We're taught so. We're taught in, in in our churches today that 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 God would never do anything horrible like that. Well, you need to read Jeremiah chapter twelve. But the question was this morning: Is have we gone beyond the point? And I said, first of all, have we gone beyond the point of preaching? Has the world gone beyond the point of preaching? Well, it did in Noah's day. It did in Lot's day. You see, the Bible said Noah was a preacher. And in 100 years, he preached the Word of God, didn't he? For 100 years. The debate is, is 120. No, the Bible doesn't say 120. It just says, I'll not... Uh, strive with man more than 120 years. But if you look at the age of Noah when he, st when he uh, started building the ark and when he entered the ark, it was 100 years. But 100 years preaching the Word of God. And how many were saved? Big revival? Huh? The Great Awakening? Jonathan Edwards in the hands of an angry God? How many were saved? Him and his family. No, no, I'm talking about, I'm talking about the humans, brother. Yeah. Eight. That was him and his family. That was it. So have we gone beyond the point of preaching? We look in Lot's day. How many were saved? In the city of Sodom. Three. Three. Would have been four, but one of them looked back. Have we gone beyond the point of redemption? Has God finally said, enough's enough? Well, one day He will. You see, the world today... They mind earthly things. And we as believers, as I close out tonight, we as believers, we ought not mind earthly things. Because this earth is not our end. Folks, we're just pilgrims passing through. Amen. Praise the Lord. And, and you know, I pray I live a good long life. I do. You know, I'm afraid to die. I just don't want to go on the next load. Okay? <laughs> but we ought not mind these earthly things. You know, the Lord said to um, the man that had a lot, of, a lot of goods, right? He said, look at all these things that I have. You know what I'm going to do? I am going to build bigger barns where I bestow of my goods. And then he said, I'm going to have plenty. So the rest of my life, I'm going to eat, drink, and be merry. And what did God call him? You fool, he said. He said, your soul will be required of thee tonight. And whose things will those be? Whose things will those be? See, we don't mind earthly things. Amen? Listen, folks, this is pressing on. Mm, keep moving on. Marking those who are examples. Amen?